On August 23rd through 24th, 2015, faculty and students from six U.S. institutions, five partner institutions in India and three in China, gathered with practitioners and policymakers in Washington, D.C. to discuss outcomes from an interdisciplinary project to assist the development of low-carbon, sustainable cities in these countries. As reported in the NAE Bridge in 2014, the work uses a social-ecological infrastructure framework and science-based tools to reduce greenhouse gas emissions and address broader sustainability goals such as economic development, water security, environmental pollution, climate change, and public health. Curriculum and field work have nurtured multiple competencies addressing intercultural learning, interdisciplinary skills, sustainability knowledge, systems integration, community-based practices, and awareness of ethics in global discussions of sustainability. I wanted to share this one slide just giving us, just sharing our experience on what it was uh, that we learned from the PIA, um, things that help doing the interdisciplinary study in a very practical way. And I think early on we realized that we, we call data a boundary spanning object in some ways in the SDS frame. Yes. So for us, we had a framework, and act, the framework that we show in the NAE article, and I think that was very valuable because otherwise we were talking across each other, so we, I think having a framework was helpful. Mm -hmm. but, but it turns out that it wasn't, it helped build vocabulary, it helped connect theories, but it helped do all that in theory, you know. You still needed something more than a framework because everybody had their own framework in their head. And then it was a lot of, you spent a lot of time to negotiate around it, but it was served a useful purpose. I think one important thing that I've learned in this conference is um, a need to develop understandings of the methods of other fields. Um, and the importance of questioning some of those methods in an effort to improve that particular field's mode of, of research. Um, so listening to other people questioning your own field and also feeling a responsibility to question the methods of others' fields. I just feel that it's a really a continuing process of uh, find, finding some common language of communication and, and across all different kind of boundaries and not only language in terms of technology, uh, te technolo technical terminology, but it could also be language of value like ethics, think, language about what we care and, and all, all those things. And that experience itself, I think it is it's the most important part. This video highlights remarks from the meeting session about ethics and the need for interdisciplinary education to meet the challenges of globalization and comments from the students about the value of their participation in the project. And I want to suggest that there are possibilities for enhancing the ethical component by thinking about what the ethics of cities is. I mean, we're, we're talking about developing sustainable cities Cities have a distinctive ethos, which we can study with ethos, ethics. And it's important for us to try to understand the ways in which urbanization historically has driven the development of ethics. Um, and secondly, to appreciate the historical development of cities and Fine. Finally, the last point that I'll try to make concerns what I might try to call the ethics of cities to complement those four other types of ethics that I knew as integrated into this project. So let me begin with just some anthropological, um, philosophical anthropological comments about ethics in cities, ethics and cities. For hundreds of thousands of years, maybe a million years, human beings lived in small tribal groups where they were closely genetically related to each other. So that trust was based upon family and extended family relationships. Cities create 
a social situation in which human beings, for the first time in their histories, have to trust people who they don't have genetic reasons for trusting. When people try to live in close proximity with each other and not be violent toward each other, they have to develop non-genetically based reasons to share a common space. And we can identify anthropologically, socially, historically, a number of different approaches to doing that. One is simply slavery and racism to say that, well, one group is genetically, humanly inferior to another. It deserves to be dominated. Um, another way is what the, the great anthropologist René Girard has called the development of the scapegoat mechanism. We, we create an evil who is in our midst, who we blame for any potential violence and problems, and then we sacrifice that scapegoat, and that creates unity within the community. Um, another way, which was typical of Greece and Rome, was to develop the notion of law, the institution of law, um, as a replacement for the ethos of the family. Still another way was to develop the notion of culture or civilization. That I would describe as, as China's unique way. Um, another way still is the way of modernity, nationalism, modern nation states. But all of these are challenged by globalization. All of these work in cities which are limited in geographical area. We now live in a world which is becoming urbanized in a global way which has never happened before. As Leo Strauss has written, classical political philosophy had taught that the salvation of cities depends on the coincidence of philosophy and political power. A founder of modernity was the first to teach that the coincidence of philosophy and political power can be brought about by winning ever larger multitudes to new modes and orders, thus transforming thought into the opinion of the public. It seems to me that's the problem we're faced with today. How can we, how can intellectual leadership help create a new mode and order of globalization? Now let me end. What we need and what I think is potential within the size framework is to go beyond distributional, procedural, professional, and research ethics. We need an ethics of cities to address the challenges of urbaniza global urbanization that struggle to avoid violence when thin genetically related individuals, because we now all know, we know as a result of genetics, we are all genetically related and even to the animals. But it's, much, it's not thick genetic relation. When we share a common environmental, economic, and information space. And I see Mumford is offering continuous inspiration for this kind of challenge. Different, I really am originally a hardcore trained as a physicist and a technologist. Most of my life was at Bell Labs, one of the greatest institutes on Earth, and, and I believed rapidly on technological determinism. But I have learned that you, technological determinism is great, but actually, when I, especially when I went into the education field and learned a lot more about engineering education, I went to a liberal arts college in India, that in fact, to, for the technology to be relevant, and as a good person who actually studied the history of these matters much more deeply than I have, that really how we change the world is impacted in a very intimate way what it means to be human. So what I have learned now in my recent past, that I've become much more of a social scientist, 
I'm not trained like many other people in this room, more by practice, that these are, that technical systems are basically social technical systems. And not only that, that you must actually cross both those divides. That is, the technologist must realize that there's enormous value in viewing the humanity issues, including the social science issues. And the same goes for the so-called liberal arts people, where technology is not just a black box which comes out of it, but rather they need to understand. We, as physicists and engineers, must be able to explain to them so that they actually get an appreciation. It's not just a black box, but there's something in there. So engineering is part of liberal arts. It's very important, and now that I've learned the social science, actually the French philosopher Comte had a hierarchy, and Nobel Prize winners have written how bad the French system was because they said mathematics was up there, then there was physics, astronomy, chemistry, biology, and so on. Social science, engineering, they didn't even figure. This hierarchy is like the caste system with the Brahmins, and I'm a Brahmin, at the top, and then there are the others, and we, we, we are at a different time. We got to rid of the, get of the caste system, not only in India, but also in the education world. So I want to end this discourse with a biograph from Anu et al's paper, which I found resonated deeply with me, because I had to find all these culture wars, and I still fight them even in the Kennedy School, because in fact, people are so stovepiped even the Roman Catholic religion or the Indian caste system is more open. It really is horrible. The way social scientists will look down on the practice, etc., and they had to work. So what I learned from that biograph was the following, that we want to get rid of this pecking order, where we actually view diversity in its finest sense. There can be creativity and originality in all of the different disciplines, and actually realize that they all add value. And that's really important. You have to go back. So the students from China and from India and the US must learn that. If I feel even some portion of the students get that, there'd be enormous progress in changing the culture. That's why you want many more women. That's why you want multicultural, etc. diversity. And so this graph actually ultimately, hopefully for the students from China and India and the US, that ultimately you go up that curve where you accept the social science, humanities, all the cultural issues are important and you value them just like you value physics, chemistry, or engineering. That's the message and that's the intercurriculum. And if that is achieved, we've made a great, great, great advance. Um, and of course, it's easy to focus on divergence. And I, I need to talk about that because I think it's a big challenge for us. When I was first hired at the School of Forestry and Environmental Studies, at Yale, I noticed that we had a project called the Urban Resources Initiative. Well, what's an urban resources initiative? We're looking at cities as resource-rich places with lots of nature and lots of people and how to make that work better, right? So uh, the actual students and, and faculty who work on this project do a wide variety of things, but one common place where we do the work is New Haven. So little New Haven, Connecticut, a small city, very diverse ethnically, economically, and so forth. And um, one of the first projects that I sat in on was about the high school, the city high school that's closest to my house, very diverse place. Um, and the fact that some of our graduate students had been working with the students at the high school to keep journals. So I went to um, a, a, cl a class or a lecture where, where uh, the head of our program was reading from these journals and what was on the minds of especially um, students who hadn't had much exposure, um, who, were, uh, who were limited in their um, ability to go out and see the world and so forth. And um, these kids lived in very, um, uh, you know, very concentrated neighborhoods, poor neighborhoods. At least these were the, the readings that I got to hear. And what did the students say? Well, when asked to write about nature, 
there, um, this, this gives me chills, that, that what they, how they responded was that nature is a very scary place, that parks are terrifying. You find, what do you find in parks? Needles, condoms, you know, gl broken glass. What, what an image, shards of glass. And then, of course, the trees. Well, we're a forestry school, right? The trees are, 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 are so scary because bad guys hide behind them, and um, you don't know what's going to happen when you walk home from this park. And, you know, I rarely admit this, but I actually was a religion major back in the day. When I, and, um, and we learn these stories about these archetypes of the forest and so forth. It's, it's, it's an ancient thing. But for me, it was something new to see my beautiful New Haven being seen in this way. And, um, and, and what I took away from it was, here I was raised on the beauty of nature, on the Psalms and, and, the, and, the, and the poems that, 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 uh, that, are, that populate religious documents. And here were these kids, just so different from my point of view, that I thought, if we can't even agree on nature being a, a, a positive thing, how can we really ever agree on anything? And, and that's sort of my image of convergence and divergence. Something that I will acknowledge now, and the students especially can agree or disagree, is that what we've done is expand people's contexts. So I'm not sure we've expanded the vocabularies enough. When I sat here, I thought, do I really understand every, P, every datum that's appearing before me? You know, is there enough uh, knowledge in, in all of our brains to understand everything from social science to engineering to biological sciences to chemistry and so forth? May, probably not. But at least we know it's important, and we know that we should keep working hard to try to understand each other's context. And part of that is because we've developed human relationships with one another. So I am very upbeat on our project. When I saw you, Venki, use the, the, that one chart about, um, it, it reminded me that, that our pyre is, is a journey. And that if we can get from one step to the next, which we measured, yes. and if we can get even to one more step, maybe that's all we'll get in the five years of the project, but that's a, that's a long way to go. For me, I came from an interdisciplinary background, and so that was what drew me to the project. And I've been really appreciative the whole time of the focus of this project on interdisciplinary research and really trying to maintain that focus. But I didn't have a background in sustainability necessarily, although I had done research in some of the locales that we were headed to, I hadn't really addressed sustainability in any way. So for me, when I had a big kind of aha moment was <laughs> literally when we walked out of the airport in Delhi and into the madness there. And that's when I really kind of realized that this is not the same. <laughs> and I traveled extensively as well before, but I just, I didn't really recognize, you know, intellectually you know what 1.2 billion people is, but until you're there, you don't really know what 1.2 billion people feels like. And so I think that for me, this program, uh, the site visits have been indispensable. And it's something that really informs how you create your research going forward. And if nothing else, it makes you a better, um, a better researcher because you can speak with more knowledge and at least experience and it kind of inf it just it gives more validity to what you're trying to do and say. I think I think the unique thing about China at least in my experience is just the sheer pace of change. Um, we visited the Shanghai Planning Museum on one trip and just looking at the picture of the Shanghai skyline from 1992 present was just shocking almost like the number of bridges they built across the river just uh the pudong how, how quickly it's grown um and then stats like um, bill gates recently had a blog post about the amount of cement that's been consumed in china the last three years is equal to the united states's whole cement consumption for the past century i believe i forgot what the exact statistic is um but just I guess sustainability is such a vague term. It has so many definitions and sort of trying to operationalize what that means in the context of cities that are growing so fast is something that I feel like was a real takeaway from our Chinese trip. 
So I think that's the interdisciplinary research give me. I can, I can be confident for the things I'm doing, but I can be very open to the results and to the different value, different evaluation and different uh, disciplinaries. And I think that's why we need to get the connection between the engineering science and the social science or liberal arts, because they're the whole at the beginning, and we just separate it uh, based on our judgments, and uh, sometimes it was not true. Thank you. I guess I would say two things have, have been impactful for me. Um, one is how hard it is to operationalize, Andrew said it, um, the things that we're trying to measure. And as a practitioner, I had all these great ideas, and I thought, oh, I'd just go into academia and I'd start at them. It's really tough. So. Um, perhaps that's not, I mean, maybe every PhD student experiences that at some point or another. Um, and the second thing was just how big the gulf is between the disciplines. I guess I really didn't know that until I started trying to collaborate with people from other disciplines. So I was still working on that. For me, I think that the Pyre Projects have, uh, has given me a really uh, good context for my work in air quality. And I think that the biggest jump for me um, was being in China and doing the different group works uh, and also just the informal um, communication between the different students, both from different backgrounds um, academically and from different countries, um, and really figuring out better how to communicate and how to work um, and also how to think like different people. So I feel like this more gave me more like real experience on doing, listening to how researchers from different disciplinary doing research and looking and listening to uh, the people at my cohort from different country talking about issue to try to understand why they make those kind of, uh, why they have the opinions and what kind of reason behind those which actually is good to to remind myself always think more and accept new ideas not just say oh that seems ridiculous which maybe we shut the door clearly the focus here on in the pyre is developing empirical research but like Rochelle pointed out there's no there's no neutral data. Um, you, you only select, you only produce some kind of knowledge or some kind of data or some kind of information because you think it has some value. You don't produce nothing that, you don't produce something that you don't think has value. So you're, you're building in, wherever you're doing your research, you've got some kind of ethical assumptions behind it. But what what the humanities can offer is self-reflection on that. Um, reflecting on, well, what are my, my values? Why do I hold them? Uh, is it right for me to hold them? Is there a way for me to work with other people to enlarge them 